So we're very happy to have Mikala Janssen, and she will be speaking about the reductive Borel star compactification and unstable algebraic K theory. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I'm very happy to be giving this talk. Um, and this is all going to be based on joint work with Dustin Clausen. Okay, so I'll just begin. And this first slide is just to make sure we are on the same page, uh, more or less. So the main motivation behind this whole project is an interest in algebraic K theory. So let me just tell you how I'm going to think of algebraic K theory in this talk. So given a ring R, we can associate to it a sequence of abelian groups, the K groups. And we define these by associating to R a K theory space, K of R, and then taking the homotopy groups. So space here is perhaps too strong a word. It's a homotopy type or an anima, if you like that kind of terminology. Um, but I'm going to call it the K theory space uh, throughout this talk. I'm also going to, once in a while, call this stable algebraic K theory, if I can mind. So this is just when I need to distinguish it from unstable algebraic K theory, which I'm going to tell you uh, what is now. So now I fix the ring R. And uh, as you may well know, the finitely generated projective modules play a crucial role in algebraic K theory. For this talk, I'm going to focus on finitely generated free modules. Uh, so this is just to ease notation, because then I can just think of the general, the usual general linear groups over R. Um, and for all n, we have a map like this from the classifying space of the nth general linear group into the k-theory space. Now on the left here, I have a space that's defined purely in terms of linear algebra internal to r to the n. So this space only takes into account this fixed finitely generated free module, whereas on the right, the k-theory space takes into account all finitely generated free modules, in fact, all finitely generated projective modules. So this is uh, one important difference between these two spaces. The other is more diffuse, but it's that these two spaces are very different in nature. Uh, so they're very different kinds of spaces. For example, the K-theory space is a simple space. In particular, its fundamental group is abelian, whereas this is a K-pi-1 with fundamental group GLN, uh, which is essentially never abelian. Now, what I want is I want to find something which sits between these two spaces. So I want to factorize this map through some other space or homotopy type. And I want this other space, this uh, star n, to also be defined purely in terms of linear algebra internal to R to the n. So it has to only take into account the fixed finitely generated uh, free module R to the n. But I want it to be closer to the K-theory space. So this is not a technical definition in any way. It's more, what I mean is I want something that's closer in nature to the K-theory space. So I wanted to share as many topological properties with the K-theory space as I, uh, as I can uh, succeed in finding. Um, <clears throat> for example, can I find a simple space? Of course, there are many, many options for factorizing a map like this. And I'm simply going to call anything that sits in between these two spaces for an unstable algebraic K theory. So the unstable here referring to this fixed M. That's a classical model for unstable algebraic K theory, namely the one given by the plus construction. So this is a homotopical construction due to Quillen, defined in terms of a universal property. So you may well know this, but let me just uh, kind of summarize the main, the main points. So the point is that we preserve the homology. This is a homology isomorphism. So we preserve the homology of the general linear group, but the, we correct the fundamental group. So we get the fundamental group is closer to that of the K-theory space, it's closer to K1.
What we do in, in this project with Dustin is that we introduce a new candidate for unstable algebraic key theory. It will be given by a category, which I denote like this, DN RBS of R. Now I need a space or a homotopy type, so I'm taking the underlying space, i.e. the geometric realization of this category. So the remainder of this talk will be telling you, I will tell you various things about this category. First of all, um, I can say that this category is, it's not hard to define. It's, um, it's, it's very simple to define, um, but I think any, any introduction of technicalities at this point is not going to be particularly enlightening. So I will just tell you that it encodes the system of splittable flags in R to the N and their associated graded. So it takes into account refinement of flags, flag preserving automorphisms of R to the N, and then in a very important way, also uses the associated gradients of the flags. And it's this latter fact that, that makes the whole thing work. An important aspect of this category is that it has some very interesting geometric origins. And this is where the reductive growth circumpactification comes in, which is also why I'm denoting it by C RBS for then. Um, so what I want to do now and what will take up most of this talk is I want to tell you where this category comes from. So I want to tell you what these geometric origins are. And then after that, I will tell you about our investigations into this category as an unstable algebraic K-theory. So first of all, I will introduce you the reductive role set complexification. So consider the general linear group over the integers. In fact, we need to consider a subgroup. More specifically, a finite index neat subgroup. If you don't know what neat means, you should think of it as being very torsion free. The point is that we don't just need gamma to be torsion free, but we need various sub quotients to be torsion free. Then this group gamma is going to act freely and properly discontinuously on the following space. So I take the general linear group over R with the usual topology, and I take the coset space where I mod out by the subgroup of positive entry scalar matrices and the orthogonal group. So this A is simply a copy of the positive real numbers. As a small remark, uh, let me just say that if I were just introducing the reductive role circumpactification to you, I would be considering the special linear group instead of the general linear group, because I wouldn't have to uh, have this extra factor going on here. I would just be modding out by the special orthogonal group. Um, however, because I ultimately want to return to this story of algebraic K theory, I want to make the final comparison more immediate. So for this reason, I want our base case to be the general linear group. Now, this space X has a natural structure of a smooth manifold. In fact, it's, diff it's going to be diffeomorphic to Euclidean space, so it's contractible. So when I mod out by the action of gamma, I get a smooth manifold. And moreover, a model for the classifying space of gamma. So this allows me to study the discrete group gamma using geometric tools. I have a, a geometric model for the classifying of space of gamma. However, <clears throat> this space is not compact. So for calculational purposes, this is quite unfortunate. It makes everything much more difficult. And to remedy this, several compactifications of X mod gamma have been introduced. Uh, and they, they are quite different and suited for different purposes. And I will introduce two of these compactifications to you now in a, in a non-technical way, I hope, um, namely the Borelsa and the reductive Borelsa compactification. The Borelsa compactification was introduced in 1973 by Borel and Serre. We denote it like this. 
the main properties of this space is, well, first of all, it's compact, it's a compactification. Secondly, it's no longer a smooth manifold, but it's a smooth manifold with corners. So it's almost, almost as good if you like. Um, <clears throat> this inclusion is going to identify X mod gamma, the interior of this manifold with corners. In particular, this inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. So the Brasser compactification is also a model for the classifying space of gamma. So now we really do have a compact geometric model for the classifying space of gamma. This is very, very useful and it's turned out to have uh, important applications. So let me just name um, perhaps the most well known. Um, Borel used the Borel circumpactification to calculate stable real cohomology of several arithmetic groups, in particular, the special linear groups over rings of integers in number fields. So this calculation in turn, in turn enabled him to calculate the ranks of the associated K groups. It was also used by Quillen to show that these same K groups are finitely generated. So these are very important uh, K-theoretic results. Um, so so this, this really has, uh, this is really an important uh, compactification of X mod gamma. The idea behind the construction is, is the following. So instead of compactifying X mod gamma, we construct a partial compactification or bordification, if you like, of X. So before modding out by the action of gamma. And then we simply extend the action of gamma to this partial compactification. And the quotient space by this action is what we now call the Borel Serre compactification. So these are the ideas behind it, but the construction of this partial compactification is very, very technical. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of what's, what's going on. So the way that I want to study these spaces, the way that I want to look at these spaces is as stratified spaces. So I want to give you, um, I want to tell you what these look like as stratified spaces, at least give you an idea. So to do this, I need to introduce parabolic subgroups. I will only talk about parabolic subgroups in GLM, so it's not, it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, first of all, a standard parabolic subgroup is a block upper triangular subgroup. So it's something that looks like this. We call it P or Q. So matrices of this form. So we simply determine fix the sizes of the diagonal blocks, then we have zeros below and we have something going on above. A rational parabolic subgroup is a conjugate of a standard one by some element in GLN of Z. Now, I just I need to consider rational parabolic subgroups because I want this conjugation action. But for, for illustrative purposes, it suffices to look at these standard ones. So you can safely ignore uh, the conjugation. Um, and whenever I'm going to, whenever I exemplify things uh, by looking at parabolic subgroups, I will say what's going on with these block upper triangular subgroups. <clears throat> As I said, the Borel circumpactification and in fact also the partial Borel circumpactification are manifolds with corners. As such, they have natural stratifications. So they're naturally stratified. As manifolds with corners. By a stratification, I mean a partition of the space into uh, a well behaved partition of the space into smaller well behaved pieces. Um, and a manifold with corners has an, a canonical such stratification given by the co dimensions of the points. So let me draw what happens in, in dimension two. So here is a corner. So remember that a manifold with corners is a is something that's modeled upon quadrants in Euclidean space. So we have a corner that looks like this. Then I partition it into 
First of all, the corner, there's one stratum. Then I have the edges here, we have two strata. And then I also have this interior, where it's just, there's just one stratum. So you can imagine doing this in higher dimensions. We stratify it by the corners, the edges, the faces, and so on. So when I do this for the partial Borel circumvexification, it turns out that it has a stratum for every rational parabolic subgroup P. And I denote this by EP. Now, what happens when I mod out by the action of gamma? Then the Borel circumpactification has a stratum for every gamma conjugacy class of rational parabolic subgroups. And these strata look as follows. So the stratum corresponding to the class of P, I will call it YP, so I'm fixing the, the representative. And it's going to be diffeomorphic to the quotient of EP by the following an action of the following group, the elements of gamma that belong to P. So I simply take gamma intersect P. This is going to act on the stratum EP. And when I take the quotient, this is exactly the stratum of the Borel circumpactification. This is a model for the classifying space of exactly this group, gamma intersect P. So the way you can interpret this is as saying that the Borel circumpactification remembers the rational parabolic subgroups. There's this up to conjugacy by gamma, but that's okay. The strata remember the groups uh, gamma intersect P. So they remember the parts of gamma uh, corresponding to the different parabolic subgroups. Now, the two, the two most important properties of the Borel circumpactification are perhaps that one, it's a manifold with corners. It's this very non-singular space. Two, it's a model for the classifying space of gamma. Now, the way this is achieved is by adding, uh, essentially by adding enough boundary to X mod gamma in order to preserve the homotopy type and to avoid singularities. And as we've seen, doing this has some very important applications. However, for some purposes, it turns out that this is adding too much boundary. For example, if you're interested in L2 cohomology, then the Borel circumpactification is in a certain sense too big. It has too much boundary. The problem is that it does not admit partitions of unity. So here I mean L2 partitions of unity. So there's, in the boundary components, in the different strata, there's somehow an obstruction, the square and stability of these partitions of unity. So to remedy this, to facilitate the study of L2 cohomology, Sucker introduced another compactification in 1982. The idea behind this, uh, this construction is the following. So the strata, of the Borel circumpactification admit decompositions like this. So the strata YP corresponding to P can be written, the class of P can be written as a product of a, uh, a space XP and a space NP. And I want to tell you what this NP, uh, NP is in, in broad terms. So NP is a model for the classifying space of the following group, the elements of gamma that belong to the unipotent radical of P. So what is this unipotent radical? Suppose we have this parabolic subgroup, standard parabolic subgroup, then the unipotent radical is the subgroup where the matrices all have identity diagonal blocks. So it's the subgroup of matrices, all of whose diagonal blocks are the identity, and there's only something going on in this corner. It turns out that this NP 
is exactly the obstruction to defining L2 partitions of unity on the Broel circumvectification. So what Zucker then did was simply to collapse the NPs. So he collapsed the NPs in the different strata for varying parabolic subgroups. And the resulting quotient space is what is now known as the reductive Broel circumpactification. Now, this has turned out to have, it was introduced in order to study L2 cohomology, but it's since then come to play a central role in the theory of compactification, and it has a lot of interesting applications. So essentially this is because it somehow sits in, in a sweet spot within these compactifications. So it, um, it allows things like studying L2 cohomology and studying LP cohomology, you can extend HEC operators to the reductive Broel circumpactification. Uh, you can't do this on the Broel circumpactification. Um, so to achieve this, we needed to collapse things in the boundary components so we, we obtain a more singular space. But it's still not too singular. So singularities are very manageable, which means that the reductive Broel circumpactification is amenable to calculations as opposed to quite a lot of the other compactifications. Which, uh, which are highly, highly singular and very hard to work with. So this is really, essentially, this is because uh, Sucker identified exactly what was needed, uh, exactly the obstruction to this uh, square integrability, and he collapsed just enough to facilitate L2 cohomology, uh, the study of L2 cohomology, but no more than that. So we allow these things uh, to be studied, without collapsing too much, without constructing a very singular space. <clears throat> okay, so this is, um, I will tell you a little bit more about the reductive Broel circumpactification. Let me also at this point admit that I'm really uh, sweeping a lot of things under the carpet, so I'm more or less completely ignoring all the, all the geometry in this story. Uh, but well, I said that the Broel circumpactification is the manifold with corners, but the reductive Broel circumpactification is also also has this uh, nice geometric structure. Um, I think, I mean, introducing it would be a very technical uh, thing to do uh, in this talk. Moreover, the way that I want to study these spaces is that I that this geometry is very important in all these applications, but I want to study these spaces from a homotopy theoretical point of view, and I want to forget this geometric structure. So therefore I'm also just uh, pushing it to the side in this talk. I do, however, want to remember the stratification. Now it turns out that the, the stratification of the Broel circumpactification as a manifold with corners descends along this quotient map to define a natural stratification on the reductive Broel circumpactification. So this is because I'm collapsing these NPs stratum-wise. So this is a more complicated stratification. It's not as a manifold with corners. We have these singularities turning up. Uh, but let me just tell you what happens on each stratum. So the stratum corresponding to the conjugacy class of P is this XP that was left when I collapsed the NP. And this is a model for the classifying space of the following group. It's the subquotient of gamma that belongs to the Levy quotient of P. The Levy quotient is the quotient of P by the unipotent radical. So in these uh, block upper triangular, in the case of the block upper triangular subgroups, what does this look like? I have this short exact sequence. And P is something like this. And the unipotent radical was this subgroup where all the diagonal blocks were the identity. And when I take the quotient, I'm simply left with the diagonal blocks. So I'm somehow identifying this virus split here as the subgroup of, of block diagonal matrices. So this subgroup, this group, uh, gamma LP is 
uh, isomorphic to the the, ele the subgroup given by subgroup of gamma given by the elements of gamma, where we only have things going on in these diagonal blocks. So this somehow su summarizes the difference between the Brel cell and the reductive Brel cell compactification. So as I said before, we can think of the Brel cell compactification as remembering the parabolic subgroups. If we think of it like this, then the reductive Brel cell compactification, it doesn't remember the whole parabolic subgroup, it only remembers the Levy quotient. So this is really what's going on when I take this this quotient and I factor out this uh, MP. As a small side remark, this is also why it's called reductive Borel cell, because this Levy quotient is a reductive algebraic group, whereas the parabolic subgroups are in general not reductive. What makes the reductive Borel cell compactification quite, uh, quite nice is that, so, so it may look weird that we want to forget uh, information, we, we, we remember a quotient instead of the whole parabolic subgroups. But the point is that these Levy quotients are just much better behaved algebraic groups than the parabolic subgroups. So they're, they're a lot easier to work with. Okay, as I, as I said, I want to study these from the point of view of uh, homotopy theory but I want to take into account this extra structure of a stratification. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to study it using stratified homotopy theory. Let me stress that this stratification is really, it's not a choice of extra data that I'm putting on the space. It's really built into the construction. They are, they are constructed as stratified spaces. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about stratified homotopy theory and the tools that I use to study these spaces. And then I'm going to start tying all these loose ends together. So I've now introduced unstable algebraic K-theory to you. And I said that we have a new, we've introduced a model for unstable algebraic K-theory. I'm trying to tell you about the geometric origin. And to do this, I've introduced the reductive role cell compactification. I will now tell you the tools with which I'm studying the reductive role cell compactification. And then I will tell you how this, uh, how we get this model for unstable algebraic K-theory. So stratified homotopy theory. So this is due to McPherson, Troyman and Lurie in, in various categorical levels. Now I've already, I've already told you what I mean by a stratified space, but just to make sure we, we're on the same page. I, a stratified space is a space equipped with a well-behaved partition. I'm not going to tell you what I mean by well-behaved. Um, I will give you an example that you can have in mind. And I will also say that it's not, it's not a very restrictive condition. It's uh, most of the natural stratifications that you will come across will be uh, sufficiently well behaved. <clears throat> As an example, we consider the two sphere here on the right, and I'm going to stratify it by the equator, Wait, there we go. the upper hemisphere and the lower hemisphere. So here I've stratified it uh, with three strata, the equator and the two hemispheres. There is an alternative way to think of a, of a stratified space. So intuitively, instead of thinking of it as a space with a partition, we can think of it as a collection of spaces or strata, if you like, together with some gluing data specifying how these spaces fit together. So in this example, I have a circle and two open disks, and the gluing data is, spec is saying that the open disks are glued to the circle along a tubular neighborhood around that circle. Given a stratified space, I can associate to it an infinity category, which I call the exit path infinity category. And this is in every way an analog or generalization of the fundamental infinity groupoid. So to be more precise, if I think of an stratified space as a collection of spaces together with some gluing data, 
then the exopath infinity category exactly encodes the homotopy type of this data. So it captures the homotopy type of each stratum, of each piece, of each space in this collection. But it also captures the homotopy type of the gluing data. So it specifies how these different spaces should be fitted together up to homotopy. If we have a space and we give it the, we stratify it trivially, so we have this trivial partition, then the exopath infinity category simply recovers the fundamental infinity group for it. We just recover the homotopy type of the of the space that is the, the stratum that is the whole space. If, however, we have any non-trivial partition, then we are breaking the homotopy type up into pieces. So we get the homotopy type of each stratum, and then we get some data specifying how these homotopy types should be should be fitted back together. I will give you two examples to maybe give you um hopefully give you some intuition for how how this works. Before I do so, let me tell you about perhaps the most important feature of the exopath infinity category. Uh, so it's a classical result that the fundamental infinity groupoid classifies locally constant sheaves on a on a space, on a sufficiently nice space. <clears throat> so in more detail, it's the monodromy equivalent saying that locally constant sheaves are equivalent to representations of the fundamental infinity groupoid. In exactly the same way, the exit path infinity category classifies constructible sheaves. Constructible sheaves are sheaves that are locally constant along each stratum. So it's the, it's the natural generalization of locally constant sheaves to a stratified space, a situation where we have the extra data of a stratification. And they are, they turn up, they're important objects of study, they turn up whenever you have a naturally occurring stratification, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it comes up quite naturally to ask things about construction, constructible sheaves. And this is perhaps also the main, the main reason for introducing the exit path infinity category, to have a classification like this. So McPherson made, made the one categorical observation that we had an, a classification like this. And then Troyman gave a two categorical version and Laurie has developed the full infinity categorical version that I've been using. Let me give you two examples and hopefully you'll have some idea of how, of how we measure uh, or encode stratified homotopy types. Intuitively, you can think of the exopath infinity category as follows. So the objects are the points of X. This is the same as the fundamental infinity groupoid, but in the fundamental infinity groupoid, the morphisms are given by paths in the space. In the exit path infinity category, I only allow certain paths, the so-called exit paths. So this simply means stratum preserving paths. In the cases that we're interested in, it means that a path can move from <clears throat> A lower dimensional stratum into a higher dimensional stratum, but it cannot go the other way. So within a stratum, it can do whatever it wants, but when it wants to leave, there's a restriction as to which strata it can go into. It can only move into higher dimensional strata, and moreover, once it's exited, it can never return, hence the exit path. Then the higher simplices are simply stratum preserving homotopies between such paths, and then stratum preserving homotopies between such homotopies, et cetera, et cetera. So here I have two examples for you. I'm going to stratify the same space in two different ways, the two sphere. So you'll also get an idea of, of how the, strat the role of the stratification. The first example is the one I had on the previous slide. So I'm stratifying the two sphere by the equator and the two hemispheres. <clears throat> and then on the right, I've written down the exit path infinity category up to equivalent. So here I have three objects, one corresponding to the equator, one corresponding to the upper hemisphere, and one corresponding to the lower hemisphere. 
The automorphism groups capture the homotopy types of the individual strata. The two hemispheres are contractible, so I have no non-trivial automorphisms there. And the equator is a circle, so I get this integer automorphism group of the green object. In terms of non-invertible morphisms, I have an exit path like this. I can move from the equator into a hemisphere. I cannot go the other way. And neither can I move from one hemisphere into the other because I'd have to cross the equator. Moreover, it turns out that this path is going to be unique up to homotopy. In fact, it's unique up to unique homotopy, etc., etc. So I have exactly one morphism from the green object to the blue object. In, in the infinity category, I have a contractible morphism space, and exactly the same when moving into the lower hemisphere. So in this case, you can see that the exit path infinity category is equivalent to a one category. In the following, we'll see some slightly higher categorical behavior. So now I'm going to stratify the two sphere by a point and the rest of the space. So a point and the punctured sphere. So in this case, I have two objects, the point and the punctured sphere, the open stratum. Again, the automorphism groups capture the homotopy types of the individual strata. Both of these are contractible, so I have no non-trivial automorphisms. I can move from the point into the open stratum. I cannot go the other way. And I have a circle of ways of leaving the point. I can choose the angle with which I leave the point. And this is going to give rise to an S1 morphism space on this side. So an S1 morphism space from the green object to the blue object. So in this case, you can see that the exit path infinity category is equivalent to a two category. OK, I hope this gives you some intuition for how, for how we encode stratified homotopy types. But let's return to, to the space that I was actually interested in, the reductive Brossard compactification. So just as a word of warning, I'm going to have a theorem on the following slide. Uh, and I've written it in full generality, but if you don't like algebraic groups and such, um, I will tell you what to think of in the in the base case example that I've been that I've been going through. Uh, so what I've done is I've determined the stratified homotopy type or the exit path infinity category of the reductive row circumrectification. So suppose we have a reductive algebraic group G defined over Q. So in our case, we just look at GLM. And we have a neat arithmetic group gamma. So this was this finite index neat subgroup of GLNZ. Then the exit path infinity category of the associated reductive row circumpactification is equivalent to the nerve of a one category, which I denote CRBS of gamma, and which is defined in the following way. The objects are the rational parabolic subgroups of G. So in our case, they are these standard parabolic subgroups and they're conjugates by G and Z. The home sets are given by conjugating elements in gamma. More precisely, and the morphisms from P to Q are the elements of gamma that conjugate P into Q. But crucially, I need to mod out by an action of the unipotent radical of P. That is the elements of gamma that belong to the unipotent radical of P. So if we call that, in our case, the unipotent radical was this subgroup of matrices with uh, identity diagonal blocks. And composition is simply given by multiplication in gamma. So modding out by this action should reflect the fact that we collapse these factors NP when moving from the Brossard to the reductive Brossard compactification. This is where this, this action comes in. Now, let me just kind of pinpoint the two main things you should take away from this theorem. So instead of focusing on, on the technicalities, the two important things about this theorem are the following. First of all, we've determined the exit path infinity category of the reductive Rolls-Air compactification. 
a priori, this really is an infinity category. But it turns out that in this case, it's essentially just a one category, that the stratified homotopy type of the reductive Boyle second petrification can be completely encoded in a one category. This is one thing to note. Secondly, this one category, the way it's defined here, does not make any reference to the space of the reductive Boyle second petrification. It's defined purely algebraically in terms of rational parabolic subgroups, their unipotent radicals, and this conjugation action of gamma. So it really gives a completely point-free way of studying the reductive Boyle second petrification. So these are the two <coughs> kind of the two things to, to take away from this theorem. Um, this point-free way uh, allowing us to study the, the reductive Boyle second petrification in this point-free way is also uh, interesting independently of this algebraic K theory point of view that I'm pursuing in this talk. Um, but I'm not going to go down that road. So let's return to what we started out with, namely unstable algebraic K theory. So let me tell you how, how this is introducing, how this is providing the geometric origins for this uh, unstable algebraic K theory. So first of all, recall maybe that an unstable algebraic K theory is anything that factors the natural map between these two spaces. Our models, the models we introduce for unstable algebraic K theory, are simply given by direct generalizations of the stratified homotopy type of the reductive Boyle second petrification. So, how does this work? <clears throat> so, this is just a summary of the theorem on the previous slide. Remember that I had this neatness condition on gamma, that it was a very torsion free uh, group. This was needed in order for this to be a nice geometric space. However, on the right, this neatness condition isn't needed at all. The torsion doesn't make, doesn't, is not a problem when I define this category. So I might as well define it for all of GLM set. In other words, I can just ignore this torsion. Now, what happens when I do this? I get a category. DGLMZ RBS. And this is simply what I define to be our model for unstable algebraic K theory over the integers. And it turns out that this is almost immediately generalizable to make sense for any ring R, so that this provides us with a category. Sorry not a category C and RBS of R through which I can factorize this map so through its geometric realization and this is exactly an unstable algebraic K theory this is defined purely in terms of linear algebra internal to R to the N <clears throat> and I can factorize this map this natural map from BGLN to the K theory space through its geometric realization so let me just summarize. So we, we look at this reductive Boyle second petrification. It's an interesting uh, geometric object, an interesting geometric space. I forget the geometry, but I crucially remember the stratification. I study it from the point of view of stratified homotopy theory. And what comes out is this one category, C RBS of gamma. I can ignore torsion when I define this category. So I get this category C and RBS of set. And it's just a very slight generalization, which makes this work for any ring R. And this is what we propose as a model for unstable algebraic K3. However, this is, this is all very well. This means, I mean, this is a nice story. I think so at least that we have these, we have this nice geometric story and it has these important geometric origins, but this doesn't mean it's a good unstable algebraic K theory. It doesn't mean it's a good model. I mean, I, I already said that I can factorize this way map in many ways. So for the, for the last part of this talk, I want to tell you about our investigations into uh, its qualities as an unstable algebraic K theory. So this is 
So there are two obvious questions to ask here. <clears throat> First of all, do these categories, categories stabilize to the K-theory space? That is, can we recover the stable algebraic K-theory from these unstable algebraic K-theories? So this is perhaps more of a consistency check. It's a, it's a reasonable thing to ask that if we introduce an unstable model, then we want to be able to recover the stable model. The second question <clears throat> is comparing it with, uh, is comparing the, in terms of the topological properties, comparing it with the classical model that's given by the class construction and also with the K-theory space. So let me start with this question of stability. These categories do stabilize to the K-theory space and they do so in the following way. So for this, I'm going to assume that R is a local ring, but let me stress that this is just for the sake of this talk. So the point is here that it allows me to stay within my notational comfort zone and only think about the usual general linear groups uh, because over local rings, any projective module is free. Uh, if I work in the general rings, I just need to take care of isomorphism classes or finitely generated projective modules. So it's all, you can kind of see what should be happening in the general case. But I think uh, doing it generally is just going to clutter up my slide. So I hope you will bear with me. Would you say local and not like PID or something? If all you're, all you care about is everything being free? Uh, true. I just, I just need uh, all finite generated projective modules to be free. Okay. Yes. But this is really just to make sure that my slides look nicer. So it's not, nothing more than that. Um, so we can define a category, which I will call M of R, as the disjoint union of these categories, D and RBS of R. There's an actual product on this, and this turns it into a monoidal category. Then we can recover the K-theory space, the stable K-theory space, as follows. So considering this category, we can look at its geometric realization. This is a topological monoid, and we simply take its group completion. This is a model for the K-theory space of R. Now, this should be compared with the classical model for the, class, uh, the K theory space due to Siegel, uh, identifying it as the group completion of the topological monoid that is the disjoint union of BGLNs. <clears throat> so, the realization of this, mon uh, this monoidal category. So, you'll note that the only difference here is that we, for every N, we simply swap GLN for this CNRBS of R. So this is answering this first question of stability. So we do recover the, the stable algebraic K theory space. Now, if, moving on to if if your ring has like finite bath stable rank, is is there like a map that's a is the is the math highly connected? Or, Which or map? maybe I'm just saying that. The, the map to algebraic K or like, uh, or I guess so the map from BGLN plus to a connected component of the algebraic K theory space is a, is highly connected in a range increasing with N assuming some finiteness properties on R. Do you have some, like, using, um, do you have a similar theorem? No, I can say one thing here, sorry. Um, so, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but I think it's maybe a relevant, a relevant point. Um, for this, this is a symmetric monoidal category, which means that we can apply the group completion theorem to this, uh, to this, and then we can, we get this uh, identification of the component of, the zero component of the K-theory space, with the plus construction on the stable general linear group. So here we get this uh, comparison with, uh, with GLNs and stability and things. However, this category is not symmetric monoidal. So we don't know anything more than it being monoidal. So we can't apply 
as such, the group completion theorem here. So we don't have the same kind of stability uh, result where we can look at this the co-limit over these categories and compare what's going on when we when we let n tend to infinity. Um, at least we can't do that yet. So we don't know if this is just a monoidal category. It's very much not symmetric monoidal, but we don't know what happens when we take uh, the associated topological monoid. If something uh, magical happens, giving us the commutativity conditions we need to apply the group completion theorem. I don't know if that exactly answers your question. Uh, sure. Um, so, <clears throat> so this was what we had on in June about stability. Uh, but moving on to the second question of comparing it with the plus construction and the k-theory space. So if R is a local commutative ring with infinite residue field, then our model simply recovers the plus construction. So this, so here we, we don't really get anything different. We could also interpret this as giving a very nice linear algebraic model for the plus construction, but that depends what angle uh, you look at it from. This result relies very heavily on work of Nesterenko Sislin uh, on rings with many units. So we have some more general results uh, for rings with many units, but in this case, we, we recover the plus construction. The point is that for rings with many units, this map, the difference between the parabolic subgroup and the Levy quotient disappears in homology. So this map is a homology isomorphism. Let, let me remark that for this type of rings, the plus construction always already seems to be quite a nice, reasonable model for unstable algebraic K theory, essentially because of this property that we don't that we don't care about the difference between parabolic subgroups and Levy quotients. At the other end of the spectrum, however, we have something like fin finite fields. And here it's a very, very different story. For one, the unstable plus construction. May I ask a question from the previous slide um, yeah. before we move on? So do you do something else for pi one? Uh, it's quite easy. It's very easy to de determine the fundamental group. Of this. Oh, I see. So it has the correct fundamental group. Uh, and then, so it has the correct fundamental group, if you like. Um, but for, for general rings with many units, you get, for all rings with many units, you get a homology isomorphism uh, with integer coefficients between the general linear group and this category. Uh, and if we have a local commutative ring with infinite residue field, then we get a homology isomorphism with all local coefficients. So we, we do recover the first construction. I see, thanks. So <clears throat> as I said, the, plus con the unstable plus construction has a kind of, has a defect, if you like, uh, which is the following. So suppose we have a finite field of characteristic P, then the FP cohomology of the K-theory space, in positive degrees at least, is the FP cohomology of the stable general linear group. And this is known to vanish by an important result of Quillen. However, unstably, the FP cohomology of the nth plus construction is, by definition, the FP cohomology of the nth general linear group. And this is highly non-trivial. Not only is it highly non-trivial, but it's not even completely determined. Um, so we have all this, uh, we can interpret this as saying that the plus construction has all this unstable noise in FP cohomology, which vanishes stably, so it doesn't make any contribution to the K-theory space. Now, what happens for our category? First of all, just for completeness, so away from the characteristic, we get an isomorphism. So we simply get the same cohomology as the 
the nth general linear group. But let me remark that this is well understood and was completely determined by Quillen. At the characteristic, however, so the FP cohomology of the nth uh, of C n RBS of K, so for a fixed n, this vanishes in all positive degrees. So in this sense, so, so we simply we get what we would somehow naively hope for in an unstable model. We get as close to the K theory space as possible. Um, <clears throat> so just to kind of, so, so in this sense, the, the finite fields, our model is, is better than the plus construction. So these are the two uh, rings, types of rings that we have been considering so far. So for local rings with infinite residue fields, we recover the plus construction. But for finite fields, we get something that's that's better than the plus construction because we get something that doesn't have this unstable noise in, in the FP column. But of course, there are many more rings to consider, but this is how far how far we've uh, we've gone now. So let me stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank Mikala. Are there any questions or comments? I have a quick question. Um, so your theorem about the exit path category of the um, reduced Borelser um, um, compactification, is there a version for the Borelser that one yes. can say the exit path category is the nerve of something? Yes, so it's exactly the same thing, but you don't model by this. I see. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Um, actually, I have one question. It's about the last slide. Yep. So does that mean that if you have any locally symmetric space, you could compute the um, cohomology class in the uh, finite field or the torsion part of it? The last theorem that you have. Do I have any locally symmetric space? Yes. I can... So uh, in other words, you are, uh, say, um, what does the last theorem mean? Does that mean that, I, I just try to see if it's, is, is the same, is it the same as say, um, the symmetric space associated to GLN model by any lattice, arithmetic lattice? Uh, you have such a statement? Uh, no, this is very much, this very much uses the fact that it's over a finite field. So I, the point, yes, the point is we uh, with, the, with the coefficient over finite field and um, the, um, any cohomology group here? It's not, it's not, star, about, yeah, it's, it's not about number rings. It's, it's, it's not about like classifying spaces of number rings. It's just about finite fields. Yeah, yeah, it's a finite field. I know, I know. It's just a, Coefficient in, say, the torsion part. Uh, whatever. Or I'll let, let, let her answer. So it's oh, not. May, may, maybe. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the point of what we do is that we look at these locally symmetric spaces and this compactification. But once we have this result about the stratified homotopy type, we, we forget that there was a, a space there to begin with. First of all, just by forgetting the torsion, and then by forgetting the fact that we were working over the integers, and then we just define it for any ring. Um, in, in For finite fields, what I can say about finite fields is that it's going to be this category, uh, C and RBS of K, is equivalent to uh, the opposite of a category that people doing finite group theory are interested in. So the... Uh, the orbit category on P radical subgroups. Um, and this result is in fact, 
I mean, we provide one proof of this, but the result is already uh, proved for this for the orbit category of P radical subgroups. So if you think of locally symmetric spaces as associated to, to finite uh, finite groups of V-type or groups of uh, with BN pairs, then maybe this is similar to what you were asking, but I'm not sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> actually uh, it's, uh, could determine the, uh, exp the, the cohomology classes explicitly, that, that's what I mean. And apart from the GLNK, maybe uh, you could replace other, in your formulation probably for any other semi-symbolic groups, right? Um, we, we can do it for, yeah, when we have the locally, when we actually have the space, the reductive broad circumplexification. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. can. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, when, that's when we generalize to any ring, it really it really uses that we're working with GLM. Oh, I see. It doesn't mean that we can't do something for other types, but it's not immediate what we do. It's okay. It's very uh, very much the fact that we we are working with the general linear groups. Okay, and also, is it computable? I mean, or just the abstract isomorphism? If you want to compute. Uh, this one. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. This is uh, this is given by, I mean, I don't know if it's computable, but it's given by the map from this inclusion uh, simply induces an isomorphism. Ah, I guess my question is. Uh, so the cohomology groups, uh, the uh, the cohomology classes that, uh, that is written there, are they explicit? Um, not not in what we've done so far. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a lot. But let's wait till. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or we can let people leave. Thank you again. Maybe I can stop the recording and, and you can keep. Yeah.